All right. What's going on, guys? This is Jordan from the Undergraduate Survival Guide. Today, we have Precious on, who's one of my favorite Bristol girls. <coughs> uh, how are you doing out in quarantine? I'm good. I'm, I'm all right. This is like usual stuff for me, to be honest. What are you, quarantine just for your lifestyle? It is. There's, there's literally no change. <laughs> I'm the same, to be fair. I find it weird when people talk about not going outside. Like, this is my life. Exactly. You know, it makes me sometimes I was having like I was deep in it the other day. I was like, should I be like, does it mean I need to change and be more outgoing or I need to like sort out my life? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but I feel like you're or maybe it's just because you work out a lot, but I feel like you're quite outgoing. No, I think I have births. So like there'll be like a weekend where like I may be doing loads of stuff and then like I'll be quiet for like a good five, six weeks. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> Would you say you're more of an introvert or an extrovert? I don't know, to be honest. I like going out, but I think it's, it's with, it depends on the people I'm with or the person that I'm with. That's the thing. But otherwise, because even if I've got a good group of people, I'm more than happy to just stay indoors. So I don't know. I don't know why I am, to be honest. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. You know, you asked me the other day... Um, what was it? Oh, no, I asked you, I said, you asked for questions and I said, what is there to do at uni other than like drink? Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have any, like, what do you do at, at uni outside of drinking? Um, I don't drink. What? What? No, I don't drink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? I think, okay. So like, I, I really like having people over. I'm sure you know anyway, or I don't know, but I like having people like, especially come to mine. Cause I don't want to have to, I live, I, I live city centre. So I'm not walking up park streets or nothing, but I like having people come to mine. And then, like, possibly I'll cook or I'll make them cook or, like, we'll order food or something like that. Um, and just chill, like, just chat or, like, have, like, you know, crack open, like, a bottle of wine or, like, sip some sip something and then just chill. Like, I think that's honestly one of my favourite things to do. Like, even my my uh, 22nd, but how old I was. Like, you know, just doing something indoors, chilled, vibe, like, that kind of stuff, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm the same type, but I feel like it's hard to be like, oh, let's come over, let's do this, let's do that. It is, it is. And I think it's like to be able to do that, I feel like you can only really do it with people that you're close with. Because if I think if you meet someone new or you're, you're just in the stages of actually becoming friends, it can be a bit weird. Or I feel anyway, it can be a bit weird to be like, oh, do you just want to come to mine to chill? If that mm. makes sense. I feel like, yeah, so. It's not really a thing that you do unless I guess you're really close or you have the typical arm oh, broke at the moment. So can we just do something, you know, low cost? <laughs> mm. It's funny you say that though, because um, who was that light skin girl that came to your party that you said you only saw like once for freeze or something? <laughs> oh, Ruby, honestly, she's actually my babe. We've had, I've, I've got like a 30 day streak with her now on Snapchat. <laughs> That's so wild. I, know. I can't even she imagine doing that with someone. She's not, it's, it's really funny because I remember that night, that night was actually a, a really fun night. Um, uh, we went and then we saw her and because, yo, it was just fully like, just a lot of like white people were very, like, there's literally mm. no black person. And I saw her, obviously she's like mixed race, half black, half white. And then it was like really, really cool. And she was so like into it. It was only later on that I found out why she was into it. Like what, I mean, not into it, but why she was so like around us. Um, but yeah, and then we just like swapped snaps. And then because obviously I was placed in Bath and I remember, and our oh, Bath was so dead, like deader than dead, honestly, it was ridiculous. <laughs> and then I remember, thank God that she, I remember her saying that she was from Bath as well. So then I, I popped up to her and then she was like, oh my God, yeah. And she only lived like, I think 20, 25 minute walk away from the hospital. And so um, I went, and so we, we went to the city centre. We went out one day, literally, we went to go for like um, dinner. And then a movie. Then this girl, because she's a bartender, thought this girl took me um, bar hopping. So we went to so many different like bars. I spent sixty pounds that night. So we spent we spent like, and she paid more because obviously she's working. I'm not. So God knows how much our total bill was together. But no, nah, it was a good night. And after that, we just like, um, what do you call it? Like, kept in contact and stuff. And like, yeah. And hopefully she's gonna come to London once this lockdown's over because she hasn't really been properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so jokes. <laughs> Yeah, no, she's she's actually lovely. Is that because I feel like placement would be the death of me having to work somewhere, somewhere small. Like, I know some minutes are in two, is it Tooton, Taunton or something, or like Gloucestershire? Yeah. 
that Torture. that would kill me working out on the village. Yeah, it's it's not like I think because it depends on the people that you're with as well. Because you have to remember they're not on your own, and medics generally are quite sociable. You know, they're quite like if you think of a lot of the medics that you know, they're quite bubbly, they're quite chatty, they're quite sociable. And I feel as well to to be a medic, you have to be flexible, you have to be quite resilient. You just have to be able to be like, okay, I'm in the middle of nowhere with people that I've never met in my life. How can I make the best out of this situation? And so you just kind of get on with it. Mm, I can see that. And I, I've always seen uh, your medical group, or just medicine in general, as way more uh, like wholesome, I guess, because you, you kind of know you're together for five, six years. Like, let's make the most of it. Mm. That's the attitude you need going in it, to be honest. Did you feel like you were... Uh, I don't know how to explain this, but from the outside looking in, you were very much in a controlled group like all the medics to stay together a lot is that kind of the same feeling when you're studying it or is, am i just wrong um wait i don't actually understand the question like uh, let me get some context like every time when i see a one of you medics mm-hmm. you're always in a group of other medics mm-hmm. but i don't i don't know men, blah, blah. i don't know many medics to hang out with like economists just like on a regs or like engineers on oh. a regular but is that like a, a general thing or am I just seeing a I think, examples? I think majority of medics keep in the medic bubble, but it doesn't necessarily mean they don't have like friends outside. But I would say that their closest friends will probably be other medics, if that makes sense. And it's, it's basically due to what you said, because, you know, we're here for five, six years. It just makes sense in the long run to you know, befriend other medics. Cause I, I know even me, I don't, I don't regret it at all, to be honest, but like, let's say a lot of my friends left last year and pretty much most of them will be leaving um, this year. And like, even this year, I was a bit like, oh mate, I'm a bit stranded to be honest. Cause I didn't really, you know, make friends with medics. Uh, most of my friends were like non-medics and all that. So it does make sense from the get-go to be like, I'm going to be with this people for five, six years. I need to know I need to know them, you know, and not only just in terms of like, um, you know, when, when like non-medics graduate, you don't want to be alone, but even in terms of like revision, I remember I was even talking to Adiola, I was like, I literally have no motivation to revise. I find it so hard to revise. And she was like, um, you know, why can't you revise as another medic? And I was literally just like, I don't even have medic friends like that to be like, can I revise? So that's really my L that I took, but I knew I took it. And to be honest, even still now, I, I don't really regret it because, you know, I, I made good non-medic friends and the few medic people that I that I know, you know, if they're calm. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Mm. Don't you don't you close to like the people you're on placement with? I mean, you live together. Um, the what what like in Bath? Am I close to people in Bath? Yeah, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't say so. Like they're all right people, but I, I don't think I'd have like anything in common. And also, like what tends to happen, especially in Bath, because it's the closest um, academy to Bristol. A lot of people literally just commute. Like one girl in my, what two girls in my flat actually literally commute every day. Uh, one of them drives, so she does like what I don't know, forty five minutes here and um, here in the back. The other girl literally hates the, the academy so much that she um, <laughs> takes the bus, like an hour and a half journey every day. And like we have like eight a.m. starts, so she'll literally be leaving Bristol at like five a.m. just so she doesn't have to like um, stay. So because of that, it's like it's really hard to like how are you meant to get to know people. And like all the kind of like activities they do, like icebreaking and all that, it's all like in the pub. And like, I just can't, if you know me, I can't stand pubs. Like you will never catch me in a pub. Like, what am I doing there? So I'm not going to a pub. So I can't really, I, I went, don't get me wrong, I did try, but it was just rubbish. I left like after, I think about 40 minutes of being there. So it's really, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, no, I feel that. I hate how uni put so much pressure on nightlife motives i mean i don't mind a club night every here and there but flushes is like monday to sunday club 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 exactly. or like bar crews pub crews i'm like i don't want to do any of this exactly it's 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 it's, it's i was actually deep in it i was like wow because if somebody comes and they're really like you know let's say or they're strict muslim or they're strict like um i don't want to enter a pub then really and truly like the the academy that we're in hasn't been able to cater to them properly you know and it's really sad because then they've left a lot of people out and even it's true even in um in freshers week i know they try to emphasize that there are so many like things that you can do that doesn't require alcohol but really and truly it's like really boring stuff that nobody would actually want to do Mm -hmm. for sure yeah 
And I feel like the people who lose out or like miss out the most are the ones who are like religious ones. Like a lot of my uh, Asian Sikh friends or black Christians that don't drink and mm-hmm. are against these like swearing and songs and stuff. These guys just don't do anything. Mm-hmm. And obviously we make our own way, but I, I wonder how quickly they'll change things if it affected their own people. <laughs> Yeah, no, if it affected their own people, as you say, it would change in a snap of a finger. But because it doesn't, then to them, the system is faultless. The system's working. So they have no reason to change. If it's not broken, for, you know, for them, it's not broken, then what? don't fix it. Mm. It's interesting because I mentioned it. Like I was a senior, re- not senior resident. When did I mention it? It must have been when I was a cook. Co- I think I was an undergrad rep in my halls and I was like, we need to organize the freshers as more like daytime events, mm. be it like going to the zoo or like a tour around Bristol. Or, like, I mean, Bristol is such a vibrant city with this Banksy artwork and stuff. You can just do anything, but it was things like, oh, health and safety. And like, no way walking out and looking at artworks more dangerous than like getting blackout drunk in a club. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I think a club night is just an, it's the easy it's the easy idea, you know what I mean? You don't, if there's literally minimal organising, all you have to do is just basically, I don't know, li- liaise with the club and be like, okay, are you open? Is it okay if we can get the, the freshers in first? Yes, and then all, then make an event on Facebook and that's it. And then people just share it. Uh, it's the easiest thing to do. Whereas I guess like, if you wanted to do something like the zoo, you have to think about ticket prices and you have to think about numbers. And then I guess as the uni says, safety, whatever that may mean to them. But yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It doesn't excuse it though, but I reckon that's their thought process. Yeah, I'm not surprised. What would you say you did like the most in your first, second year? What, in terms of like going out and stuff? Yeah, like being active, meeting new people. Um, so first year, I was really like, I want to meet as many people. I want to find like a really good group of friends that I will like be friends with for like ever. So I tried, like, I, I went to like, I joined the track and like the athletics club um that wasn't great it was quite clicky uh the training was uh not great either um so I stopped that which was annoying because then you end up I like paid what a good 70 80 quid for the joining fee and I only went for like a month so that was rubbish um so I couldn't really do anything then what else did I try I did I did join um it wasn't part of the uni but in the watershed which is like near the harbour side of Bristol there's like they do like um spoken word poetry so I would go there quite a lot I didn't really meet anyone because of that <laughs> I'm not I'm not and I even though I, people say I, I am social like with people that I know I'm very social but like I'm not I'm not social and I can't with new people I, I can't like easily go up to a person and start a conversation like that so I didn't really meet anyone but um I, they, there was one person who said he's seen me before and then we became, and then we just started talking and became friends then. Like, I don't know if you know him, but Chris, he was in the year above us anyway. Oh, but, I know Chris. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't want to say his name, but yeah, him. But apart from that, that's basically what I did um, first year. I spent so much money on those um, nights, over mic nights, but they were worth it. They were really, really great. Second year, second year was more, was when, more when I um, actually just started, like, chilling. Like, my favorite thing to do, second year, when literally I invited anyone and everyone around mine to chill. So like, I remember I'd be having like Harry round mine, Ore, Joshua, um, uh, like Michael, Chris, especially because me and Chris used to live really close together as well. So that's that's when I didn't really go out much in second year. It was more just like people would come to mine and then we would just chill, eat food, chat for like ages. But yeah. Yeah, that's a Yeah, yeah. It's my favorite thing to do, to be honest. Second year, like, I feel like I should have should have invite people around more often because at the time it's like i'm living with seven other guys in the corn street it was like mm. what, why do i need to invite people around if everyone's here mm. but at the same time there are so many guys and girls that it's like i just fell out of contact with and i feel like that's normal in first year to second year anyway because like freshers is this big thing but yeah it's crazy how quickly you can go from like being best friends to you know i'll see you in lectures yeah it's true because you were you were like why i mean second year you were Quite. To be fair, I don't think I even knew you properly in first year, did I? Um, I probably knew you more through like Doobie and ACS events. Yeah, because I, I but... fair enough. And I think in second year, obviously, I I only probably pro- properly knew about you through Josh because obviously he was your flatmate, and he would just tell me that you were just quiet and that you were always in London. So 
<laughs> I, I, yeah, I just thought I just thought you were just you weren't about that life in itself. So like fair enough. That's what learning to drive does to you, man. I was home like every other week. I mean, I drive. I don't go anywhere. I stay in London. You always. I mean, I guess because you you don't drive this year, right? And it's a lot of placement work. Yeah, last year, but yeah. Also, I'm not paying that twenty pound fuel cost. So you have money. I don't. I literally drove to like Bristol and back the other day and it took one bar of petrol out of six. I don't understand that. So that means what's wrong with my car then? <laughs> to be fair, because I don't know how my car is this efficient. It doesn't seem right. You just count your blessings, man. Literally. But then I do feel like having a car at uni, other than like being able to go places, is a big unnecessary expense. Like insurance. Yeah. So we're drawing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. And yeah, then I think especially like now that I've, and I really hope it, even to you, I really hope I didn't take the mick because I've, I realise now that people have just been taking the mick with me and I've only been driving for like less, still less than a year. Do you know what I mean? Like with just little things, can you drop me off here? Can you do this? And like, it's, and I don't, I don't even enjoy driving. I think you actually like driving, don't you? I don't even like it. So I think that's the thing with uni. I feel like you, people actually take the mick. And I honestly, I feel so, I just want to extend my apologies to anyone who I've um, gotten a lift from or asked for a lift during uni and they've kindly done it and I haven't maybe appreciated it enough that they've done it because it's actually long. It is. And I know you're, you're one of those girls that, I think you were telling me once that if people, if you offer to drive someone somewhere, expect them to ask, to offer to pay for petrol or something. <laughs> I just think that's, no, I honestly just think that's the right thing to do. Like, especially if I'm, if I'm driving you somewhere, I don't even care if we're going to the same destination. I don't care. If I'm driving you somewhere, then you should offer to pay because what? You decide to take the bus or the train. You're going to be paying for that. So the least you can do, I'm not saying pay for the whole thing or give me like, I don't know, £20 pounds, whatever. Le- le- literally, the least you can do is like even offer and then let me be like, no, it's fine. Do you know what I mean? Let me be mm. like, no, don't worry about it. But at least offer, like, even if you have no intention whatsoever, still offer it's just courtesy because then whether you know it or not i'm literally going to make i'm like not not make sure but like, i'm going to be less likely to want to give you a lift because like, the people that have actually offered to like pay me back like i've literally especially if it's like a, a silly like route i'll be like no but then i'm more likely to be like oh do you want a lift like i'll literally ask them if some of them happen to ask me for a lift whereas i feel like the people who have just taken it for granted like you won't see me offering to give them a lift like you would have to come and ask me because it's just that like, you don't you don't respect like the like it's it's expensive. Driving is expensive, man. And like things you have to even watch out for, making sure that you're not speeding if you get caught with by the camera, making sure that all this parking stuff as well. Like they don't they don't know about oh let's go drive X Y Z. Okay, but is there free parking? Why can't you just pay for parking? But I'm paid for fuel and parking. Like it's just long, it's just long. I don't like driving, man. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I get you. It does add up. I I always thought like I paid what fourteen hundred for my car, like around about the same for insurance first year. I thought, all right, I'm done. And then that's like £40 for petrol every week or something. I'm like, what the hell? And then oh. I've got a parking ticket for like £60. I'm like, oh my days. It's really, yeah. if you're not careful, like... It, it racks up big time. Do you think you'll like keep your car after you graduate? Well, I'm hoping, because my car's old and the mileage is quite... It's, I mean, I don't know. What do you think? You know my mileage. I, and I think it's quite high. But the thing is, I don't drive a lot, so I don't think I'll rack up high mileage. But I know, but anyway, I'm, I'm babbling. I hope, hopefully, by like after my F1, uh, which is like my first year, the junior doctor, I'll get a new car because um, it's tiny, man. It's so, so tiny. Like it literally, it can't fit a lot in it. Mm. So I like the fact that it's tiny. Don't get me wrong. At, at the first car, I think it's perfect. But in terms of like actual logistics, like even when I was redecorating my room when I came back, like having to like um I went to go I went to go pick up like um new table and stuff like that like being in the car was just a myth it was a joke um yeah and even like when I'm coming back to London I have to put my suitcase in the back seat I can't ever put it in the trunk because my trunk is just it is it is just ridiculous it shouldn't <laughs> be called a trunk it's so tiny so I think yeah I'll definitely get a, a new car but um it probably won't be, be till like I don't know, after I've done my F1 or in the middle of my F1 when I actually have money because your girl ain't got money at the moment. Them ones. Mm-hmm. I hear that. I want a bigger car as well, but I don't, I'm not, you know, happy about having to park a, a big car around. 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know how medicine. Well, what? Are you really gonna need to? I'm not. As far as I know, NHS doctors still have to pay for parking at hospitals. What, like students parking and placement? No, like for actual work. Oh no, you can't like even if you're a doctor, you you still have to pay for your parking. There was even that thing in with the whole COVID going on that they were starting to let um doctors have free parking only now. So before, like doctors, mm. they they don't they don't care. You still have to like be paying. Like you still get doctors who cycle to work or even get the bus because it's cheaper, and having to like pay for parking. That's so wild. Yeah, even in placement, I was like, I have to look for a residential parking, and then some actual idiot like keyed my car because obviously i must have parked like like it wasn't it wasn't designated designated parking by the way it was just you know free residential parking okay and i just parked mm-hmm. it there and then this guy well, well actually not it might be a girl keyed my car and i was just like yo you know what i know it must be annoying someone taking your parking space but really you don't need to be keen like it's just a bit it's just too far you know like there's no need to do that but yeah yeah that's the pain flipping it now do you feel i mean uh... I know I asked you this kind of briefly before, but has this whole situation made you reconsider doing medicine as well? Well, the, uh, I don't know. It hasn't made me reconsider because I think even from the get-go, not the get-go, let's say second year, I was a bit like, oh, I don't know if this medicine thing is for me, to be honest. But I, I've always known to be, not known, but let's say beginning of, this year like this academic year that is so like September I kind of already knew that medicine in, so medicine split into like surgery and medicine by the way um so when I say okay. medicine I mean kind of I kind of like your cardio um so like your heart your lungs kidneys all that kind of stuff and when I say surgery I mean more like what you know operating operating surgery but I always kind of I think from the start of this academic year I always kind of knew that okay I'm probably not going to be in medicine so I'm not going to be doing your kind of like res- like lungs respiratory cardio like heart kind of stuff I'll probably be more in your um like your surgery side not necessarily operating but like doing the sur- surgical like specialty so in that so because of that I think I haven't I haven't my decision hasn't really changed because of the whole COVID thing because COVID thing let's say and most pandemics like and all infectious diseases they're more in the medicine side they're not really in the surgery side so it hasn't really changed my view so coming back from uh, technical difficulties, <laughs> I was asking like, how the same way we have like final year meds who are helping volunteer and stuff in the NHS, I assume mm-hmm. it would be the same for surgeons in that as well. Um, okay, so from what I know, so this is from, I because I just finished my um, orthopedics and trauma placement before they sent us home. And one of the consultants who was teaching us um, he's a, a surgeon hip a hip and a knee surgeon he he was basically saying that all they're going to be doing is basically just assisting because one most uh surgery um like kind of shos uh registrars uh consultants whatever it's like from what he's saying okay so take everything that i say from a pinch of salt that you're really out of it because the thing with medicine you, it's a constant learning like it's, and it's a constant revision and not in terms of like sitting down and revising and going over what you're taught but because you're in in on the ward you're literally going over things over and over again so for them for them and you have to think about as well these consultants in respiratory um which is uh where most of the you know the covid stuff is happening because it is a lung pathology um most of the most of the like the work is in the respiratory area they've been doing respiratory for years you know just like you know think about you finish your foundation placement which is two years then you start your core training which is like I don't know it varies from like three to eight years and then you go on to do registrar and it, and it can take up to like eight plus years to do registrar and then you're you're looking for consultant positioning so you've got you've got years of backing on you so for, for the surgeons in like surgery to then like move into respiratory it's, it's not possible and it's unsafe practically like frankly so the main thing that I think non, especially not, like maybe medicine can kind of help us. The the main thing that surgi- surgical um, doctors will be doing is kind of just assisting, if that makes sense. Um, don't ask me what I mean by assisting, but I guess you know, just like check, like checking obs, uh, or just basically I don't know, being the run run around man for the um, the respiratory like sur- uh, surgery, the respiratory like consultants or SHOs or something like that. 
Um, but yeah, if that answers your question. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. I suppose when you say it like that, it's almost like surgeons are like you might as well just be a regular person when it comes to switching to raspberries, raspberries like that. <laughs> raspberries. <laughs> I'm giving up with pronunciations today. Oh, but no, I get that. Yeah. It's just because, like, each speciality is so detailed and, like, they all have their individual exams. Like, you just can't really expect, like, you know, oh, like, for example, all these TV sh- um, TV shows are so nonsense, especially, like, The Good Doctor. Like, you can't you can't expect one doctor to be able to do um, an aortic dissection, um, aortic um, rupture repair, then be able to also do a limb repair, or and then also be able to do brain surgery. Like, it's absolutely nonsense. Like, it's not possible. So... The most other doctors can do who like who mostly do elective surgery. So, for example, things like cataract surgery will be, um, you know, postponed. So those doctors instead will then be able to help. I don't know, with assisting in respiratory or, or wherever else needs help. That's it. It's not like they're going to all of a sudden become respiratory doctors because they, frankly, they can't. They don't have enough. I mean, they don't have the in-depth knowledge as much as like the other respiratory doctors do. All they can really do is just assist the best they can. But again take what i'm saying with a pinch of salt i'm not a doctor <laughs> yeah okay that's interesting i guess i could ask like would this not make you consider private versus public a bit more or is it so still I, completely the same i frankly want it to go private but for different reasons not necessarily because of the whole pandemic stuff but i i want private care for different reasons is it much different in terms of the quality of of doctors and surgeons and stuff? Because I assume it's just it's more or less no waiting time as opposed to better doctors. Yeah, so frankly, the doctors that you're going to get in private care are the do- same doctors that are going to be in NHS. The The main difference is, you're correct, it's like um, waiting time. And also, because the NHS is state-funded, to get a lot of procedures, you need to meet um, certain like criteria. So, for example... People who suffer from like fibromyalgia or like rheumatoid arthritis in order to get like kind of high end, not high end, but like kind of like the, how do I say it without it sounding weird? Like the top tier or like the kind of like new drugs that are that are that are really expensive so the NHS can't readily fund it. In order for, for them to get their hands on those drugs, the patients that is, they need to meet certain criteria and only then can they get it. Whereas if you were in private care, because you are paying for this, you, you can easily get the drug. Or do you get it? Or like, or let's say it's something like um, if you got fibroids, like um, it's basically masses that grow on in the in the female's uh, womb, uterus. Uh, I'm trying to use lay terms, but yeah, like if you've got those kind of things, the NHS, like frankly, unless they unless they cause pain or unless they're really hindering you in some sort of way, then you can get put on a waiting list, which is like so long to hopefully get surgery to remove them, for example. Um, but that whole process can take ages like even for you to just get put on the waiting list can take like a good six months just to get that um, all sorted out because then you have to think about you go to the GP how long does it take you to get a GP appointment you go to the GP how long does it take the GP to refer you for a scan and then you go to the scan how long does it take for the scan results to even get interpreted how long does it take for the scan the interpreted scan results to get relayed back to your GP how long does it take for you to then get an appointment with your GP how long does it take for you to, uh, for your GP then to refer it again back to the right um specialty to look for stuff like do you get what do you get the gist um, mm-hmm. so that can take ages whereas if you're in private care you know you can get your you can get your scan done within days, possibly even the same day, then you can um, do your preoperative check to make sure that you're fit for surgery and get the surgery done within weeks, you know. So that's that's kind of like the difference between it. It's the same care, or it should be the same care, quotation mark, um, by the same doctors. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Mm. I always feel like, I mean, on the topic of things taking long in the NHS, from the outside looking in, at least, it seems like the biggest problem is tech. Like when my mum was in hospital, it was very much like writing stuff down, handing a note to the the nurse at the reception and then them typing into some database. Like it'd be a lot easier if they walked around with just more better tech and if they can update records like instant instantly. Yeah. That seems like tech, the biggest tech is thing. Money. Yeah, that's true. But I think a lot of a lot of um hospitals now are going um paperless. But um you have to think as well, it's really funny, but it's, like, it's just like your lecturers, like old people are just absolutely useless with technology. Like I remember I was in one clinic and I think they, they added an iPad 
there was, so like NHS is slowly going like paperless, but this doctor, this consultant, yeah, like this guy had, you know, two degrees, how many published um, papers, was really struggling with the iPad. And let me not even lie, you know, I'm, I'm a young myself. He was looking at me for help and I was just like, you're looking at the wrong person because I, I don't know either. So it, it's not really that easy. Uh, sometimes using the tech and paper can be easier. But I think generally speaking, a lot of stuff is going online now. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get that. That's funny how people, like I'd love to see the numbers of um, tech literacy between ages. Because mm. I, feel, I feel like, I mean, my uncle, at least, he's very good at tech. He's only, what, 41, 42? But I'd love to see how how it actually pairs up in terms of statistics because, yeah, I've seen some some old guys just struggling using their fingers to text. <laughs> that That's the funniest. No <laughs> thumbs. <laughs> now, tech is hard, though. I think because you are, you're good with tech. Like, even remember when I'm, I'm like, I still don't know how to use that bloody Premiere Pro like stuff, but to be fair, I, I, I give up quite easily, so I don't really know. <laughs> I think tech is hard to be honest. That's why I, I kind of have a bit of sympathy with the older people and the lecturers who who always find it a bit difficult. But that's mm. just me because I I know myself that I struggle with tech. Yeah, that's I get that. For me, it's the, I wouldn't say it's the opposite, but I feel like tech's quite intuitive. But then, you know, someone like you who wants to go into surgery, I find like if I had to, I played operation and that's that's impossible. But <laughs> I can set up an iPad quite easily. It's different. Everyone's different. Everyone's got their own different skills and stuff, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. That's what makes the world run round. How, like, at what point did you realise that you wanted to go into medicine? Or was it just Nigerian mum standard stuff? Do I even know if I want to go into medicine? That's the question. <laughs> I can't lie. This is what happened. I actually wanted to go into dentistry. This, this is honestly what happened, the honest truth. I wanted to go into dentistry since I was in year 10, 11. And I remember like in my in my summer holidays before going to sixth form, um, I was meant to do like a work experience at my local dentist, which is literally like two minute walk from my house. But then I think something happened. Like I think the dentist like wife had a ba- baby. So he went on like um, paternity leave. So he was like, oh, you know, next like Christmas holiday or whatever. So I was like, calm. And then um, I left it anyway. I, I left it for a bit. I didn't really bother him. And then my sixth form, basically, if you weren't doing medicine, they didn't really care about you. Like, not not in, like, a bad way, but, like, you just didn't get the attention. And at the time, like, not that I'm an attention seeker, but I was just like, yo, I, I, want, a, I, I want to help with, you know, UCAS, and I want to know all the best tips, you know. And somehow I just kind of, like, I don't blame my sixth form, but I just kind of, like, got swayed into the whole medicine thing, because especially I think there was about maybe eight of us or 12, like eight to 12, and then, you know, you'd want to be involved in a talk as well and as well I was thinking oh medicine dentistry how different can they really be um and then I think as I started doing a lot more like um applying for like medical um what would you call that thing work experience and all that kind of stuff the amount of effort I put into it and then and then also at the end of year 12 you have to do your like um UCAT and BMA which is like your medicine medicine entry requirement test for uni and I was kind of like oh my god okay let me just apply before it's too late and start doing that I was just kind of like, I'm too in deep in it now, in deep in medicine. Like, I may as well just commit. And, um, yeah, that's just basically what happened. So it's not that I ever wanted to do it. I don't think my parents really cared, to be honest. I think as long as I went to uni and, and did a degree that, you know, to them made sense, that's it. You know, I wouldn't say they, they're like, I mean, to my brother, they were actually quite like, oh, you need to do medicine. But I think to the rest of us, they were pretty chilled. Like, as long as you went to uni and study something that made sense to them they were calm but I think for me it was just a bit of a a whirlwind which is generally my whole life I just kind of like go where the wind blows me <laughs> and deal with the repercussions later <laughs> that's interesting actually I think my sixth form was similar it was like if you're applying to Oxbridge or medicine they gave us like all this time they, they sent us all to this JFS like a uh, Jewish free school to like a application UCAS special mm-hmm. training day for, the, for for a day and it's like they gave us so much and I can see a lot exactly. of people didn't even want to apply to I mean I didn't even want to apply to Oxford but my school were like look if you if you say you're going to do it we'll get your UCAS out of the way by October the yeah, exactly. give you all this stuff I'm like yeah screw it let me let me get rejected why not <laughs> <laughs> Bristol reject oh my god I mean no Oxford reject <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, it's so crazy. I was having a chat with my friend from, from school as well. Like, I don't know how it was for you, but we very much felt forced into uni in the sense of, you know, they'll help you with your exams and stuff. They'll, you get cheaper prom tickets or something if you do UCAS by a certain deadline. And it's all this oh, like... Wow. Yeah, it was nuts. My head of year was literally like, if you don't submit your... Like, if you don't hand in your UCAS form, we're going to refund your prom ticket or something. Oh, man. Wow. But and you know that is go why. Uni, they were like, you know, just give us a reason why or do it or no prompt. But you know why? Because, you know, especially with um, sixth form and colleges, they get more rep by the amount of people that go to uni. Like, even if you're, because I remember when I was looking for different um, sixth forms to go to, it was kind of like this many people went to uni afterwards. You know what I mean? And that's that's a good um, stat that they like to use. So I think, honestly, I think that's why they push it so much. And obviously, if they can see, if they can increase the numbers that go to Oxford or Russell Group, that's even better. Whereas saying that, you know, other people went to apprenticeship or they're doing or they found work. It just sounds better. So I, and I think that's why they push uni so much. And not that they necessarily care that you do higher education, but just because it looks good for the sixth form or college. Yeah, that's really sad, though. I mean, I'd want to know how many of their students graduated from those top unis, because, like, you're kind of putting mental health on the line when it's like going to Oxford just for the sake of our numbers. Like, yeah, they don't really nobody, track you once you get out. About- Nobody cares about mental health. They just pretend they do, just to like tick tick off a box. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Have you learned any like mental health stuff in in medicine? Um, not yet. We do we do psychiatry in my next block, so that's next year. I'll be doing psychiatry. But me personally, um, so I work. This is completely non uni related. I work with a, a charity called Colorful Minds, and it's basically like a bunch of psychiatrists and counselors. Um, and I do that. And I also do um, a kind of like phone helpline um, thing that I do during during term time for like <laughs> mental health stuff. But I think aside from that, you will learn it in med school. It just depends what block you do it in. And I think they leave it till fourth year. Um, I, but it's a big block, to be fair, which is quite which is good. Um, mm. So it's like you're going to learn it a lot because there is a lot in, in psychiatry. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I've always found it interesting, like, if you're in bad physical health, you can see a doctor. But if you're in bad mental health, you've got to pay, like, 20 grand a session for a therapist that's going to say, like, yeah. how do you feel today? Okay, your time's yeah. up. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, I would always, I don't know, I mean, I don't, I don't even know what NHS offer. I should probably learn more about it, but you'd think you can get free counseling. Honestly, they don't, they don't offer a lot. I, they don't offer a lot, I think. And the thing is, to even get to what they offer, you have to go through so many hoops and hurdles like you have to show that i don't know you've been depressed for x amount of time you have to like you know give reason you have to be on again on like a waiting um a waiting list and all that kind of stuff so you have to get and even then it, it's just cbt a couple of therapy sessions that are like funded by nhs like maybe like three and the thing is that the 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 time span between them is so long that so many different things like your mood could have fluctuated like 20 times in between that um, time span you know so it's it's not because the thing with therapy you need to make sure it's regular like weekly or, or bi-weekly if I mean not bi-weekly like, like every other week if anything but at the, at the same time I don't want to blame the NHS because it's all down to funding so if the NHS mm. has funding, there's only so much they can do so I'm not blaming the NHS but I'm just saying you know it's different yeah definitely I like <laughs> I'm always trying to to stay is it what's it apolitical or like non-bias on the podcast but I've noticed how a lot of the government officials are talking about, like, uh, the war on coronavirus, uh, protect our NHS, and they're very much making it seem like these NHS deaths are as part of a war. Like, ho- like doctors dying is a, a good thing because it shows that we're winning the war or fighting hard or something. Yeah. It's like, if you just paid them more <laughs> and we had better facilities in the first place or we took action sooner, things could be very different right now. Exactly. And it's think- interesting how people always try and twist things to fit their agenda. It is. And the way that they're portraying the NHS staff as well, it's like by calling them heroes, like the NHS aren't soldiers. They, they didn't take this job to risk their lives. They took this job to help save other people's lives, not risk their own. You know, the, 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 the doctors that perhaps took their job on knowing that they may risk their lives are doctors who, you know, are in inter- infectious diseases. And that is like one, one, you know, I won't say little, but one section speciality in the whole of medicine. The other doctors, you know, didn't have the intention of risking their lives. So by labeling them heroes to make to make it sound, you know, you know, nicer and more palatable, more aesthetic, it's just it's ridiculous. 
mm. like to carry on that whole trend. Oh yeah, you're, you're our heroes. No, no, they're not. They're everyday people who are, this is the job that they decided to do, you know, a job that they didn't intend that will put their life at risk. You know, they're not soldiers. They're not policemen. They're not fire firemen either. They're just here to save you while not having to worry about them dying while doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like, I don't think I've ever met, but like, the type of people that were clapping for at 8 PM, all I know is my GP and they didn't do <laughs> like, I imagine a lot of them are just chilling right now. Um, honestly, I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what, what they're on at the moment. I don't know. But the thing is they, they are still doing some tri- um, GPs are still doing triaging. So that's basically when you just have your, your GP appointment over the phone. Um, you might be thinking, well, that's a bit pointless. I mean, to some extent it is, it's not meant to be for proper GP appointments though, but obviously that's the best they can do because mm. you know they they can barely supply PPEs for hospitals, let alone for GP practices. So that's it. And you know, I, w- I wouldn't say they're chilling, but it's like that's all they can really do to help at the moment. So, and as I said before, with, with the whole sur- surgeons um, being able to assist respiratory and, and other medical things, GPs, you know, it's not really feasible. They, there's not much they can do to even assist people in the hospital because. You know they're they're in their own different specialties speciality. So I want to say they're chilling, but it, it, you know it just looks it just sounds bad. But I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they're doing their part. The silent the silent um workers. Yeah, no, no, you mean it's interesting because like in engineering we have several different disciplines, but we all kind of have the same fundamental knowledge. I never imagined mm-hmm. like medicine was so diverse in terms of you know the amount of training you guys go through, but I guess it's for a good reason. Yeah, I mean, we, I guess, I guess everyone, I guess every doctor does have the same kind of fundamental knowledge. But I mean, I guess after a while, you know, if you're not practicing, it's like you lose a skill. You know, I mean, if you're not practicing respiratory medicine, if you're not practicing cardiology or renal for for a while, you're you're going to forget, you know, kind of like some of it. You, you, you know, probably you won't, probably won't forget all of it. Like you'll still understand, you know, how it may interact regarding to your speciality, but you know, you're not going to remember everything like you did when you were fresh out of uni or when you were a foundation doctor mm, that's true i want to ask because like i feel like in school where you're kind of raised to as a guy at least i feel like guys are generally more active than girls because of like sports or you're always supposed to be football and stuff and pe whereas other than you and like one other girl i don't know many girls that are you know in good shape and like you do medicine <laughs> was that something that were you inspired by your course or like, how did you get into into being active? I mean, I remember I used to do um, athletics. I used to be like, like proper athletic. Like my coach met me in my year six PE year, which is jokes because I even lost it. I lost the race, but that's only because I didn't know where the finish line was. <laughs> Literally, I, 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 I thought I thought I already crossed the finish line. And I hadn't, but obviously I lost because of that. Um, but yeah, and he basically spoke to my mom. And my dad and they changed the secondary school that I was meant to go to. Uh, I was meant to go to another one and they changed it. And basically, I honestly, it's only God that gave me my grades to finish uh, secondary school because literally for a good five years of my whole secondary school time, I missed like every month, every Tuesday and Thursday, I missed um, afternoon le- uh, afternoon or well, not lectures like classes. So. Mm. Um, yeah, and that's because I was doing like athletics training. They'll take us out uh, of school for training and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I trained a lot. I competed a lot. Um, I did like English schools and London schools. And I, I rep- uh, went uh, to like World Catholic School Games in Hungary. So where we represented Great Britain. So I was really, really active. Yeah, yeah I was really, really active and stuff like that. And um, I got, I kept on getting injured. Like I'm hypermobile. So I, I'm quite prone to injury. And I think it went, I, then I changed school then went to I went to another school for sixth form and my school was quite far out and I had to like pay for like my transport so I was also doing a lot of like part-time work like really really random different part-time work and I just honestly I'm not good at balancing stuff like I can I just close down if I don't like stress I don't like difficult situations so I was just kind of like I kept on getting injured athletics was stressful at the time as well and like it was just it was just more money that I had to pay for in terms of like training kit competitions um physiotherapy all that kind of stuff so I just I stopped it um yeah so that's what happened but yeah I've always been I've always been active it's, it wasn't necessarily anything to do with medicine I think even at coming to uni I've become 
this this is like the most least active I've ever been in my life thus far, like coming to uni, because up and from like year seven to like year, like halfway through year 13, I was literally like training minimum twice a week for like a good three hours. It's crazy. Yeah. It's a shame life does that to us. Like you suddenly get all these things on your plate that you've got to deal with, like work and uni and all these things you've got to balance your time with. And mm. then like, obviously you talk about fitness. I know a lot of my friends talk about how they stop reading books in uni because there's no time anymore. Like it's quite sad. Mm. Yeah. I used to read as well. Yeah. It's peak, but you know what? That's life, isn't it? And if you really love something, I can't lie, you're gonna carry on doing it. Like I could I did try, but as I said, the, the uni's athletics um society was shambolic and it wasn't a nice environment anyway. And also I just kept on getting injured and I and honestly I just took this from a sign of sign from God that like you know what it's not it's not for me. Like like athletics did what it needed to do for me. Like, you know, it made me look good on my application. I remember even in my interview for medicine at Bristol. Like one of the interviews when I was talking about, it, he completely forgot about the whole interview, and we just started talking about his daughter and how his daughter was also in the same competition that I was in. So that was jokes, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he called me like top, top, you know, because I got, I was one of the ones that got the um, accepted really quick as well within like few weeks. So I'm pretty sure he helped me out with that. So athletics for me did what it needed to do at the time. So it was worth all the like kind of stress, if you, if you get what I mean. And like I have such great experiences, you know, from athletics and. You know, it's it's. I've still got a love for it, but me personally, I wouldn't go back to it just because I think it hurts too much knowing that I was I was on top, and now that I'll be in the bottom. But I think regarding other things like reading, if you really love it, you can get back to it regardless of whether you're in uni or not. Like people do it. There's nothing like oh, if this is everything's a bit too much. You just gotta calm yourself and then get your priorities in order. Like how much do you actually love reading, and how much do you think this is going to be good for your mental health and your overall well-being? If you think it's really good, important, then fit it in somehow. Like. You know, there, there, people always used to say there's like a triangle at uni. It's sleep, revision, and social life. And you have to, you, you can only basically have two. Like you have to you give up one. You know, like some people, the top dogs, you know, especially medics um, tend to give up sleep because, you know, they revise all the time, get great grades, and they're also very sociable. You know, I think for me, I gave up revision because I like to sleep and I like to, you know, socialize. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not saying that's the best one to give up, but... You know, I think that's what that's what that's just what happens. And if you, you can always fit stuff in, it's just about what are you willing to sacrifice, what are you willing to move about. And, you know, I'm lazy and I can talk it. I I won't necessarily like implement it in my life, but I think you know, there's no excuses. You can always still read. You can always still carry on with rugby or whatever. It's just mm. it just depends if you like. I can still carry on with athletics, but I just didn't want to be in that environment. I just didn't want to you know have to do that. It was literally like a 30 minute train journey to get to the athletics uh, part in Bristol that's long I wasn't about that I like easy stuff you know so I, I just stopped it that's wild half an hour is my life is job. wild <laughs> it's mad it's mad and the track is it's not even a hard track because I don't know if this makes sense but in, there are two types of tracks in athletics there's like a soft track and a hard track hard tracks are usually just for like competing because if not they'll mash up your knees but mm. this one wasn't even like a hard track it was literally just concrete and they painted red over it like it didn't make sense <laughs> The track was symbolic, <laughs> like it was just it was ridiculous. Right, months of nine K a year for for a patch of road. Exactly. That's nuts. It was mad. Uh, I think what you mean though. I do feel like schools kinda let us down in terms of you don't really learn time management in school or like financial education. You kinda I guess teachers expect your parents to teach you to like manage your finances or to do with your time and I guess like with homework and stuff, but I definitely felt underprepared coming to uni. I was like, damn, there really is. Like, I really got to pick and choose what I can and can't do now. And that's a, that's a new mm-hmm. thing to, to a lot of people, I feel like. Yeah, I think for me, because I had to, like, fund, like, I've, I've been funding myself for God knows how long, but I think because I was, I came to uni already kind of having a good idea of how to do th- those kind of stuff. So I think that's why I was quite quick to just be like, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. Okay, I'm going to stop doing this. So... Thankfully, I think I was all right in that department. Mm. How come you started working, like, in secondary school and that? Because, like, I had to, like, get the tube to, um, like, my sixth form. My sixth form wasn't close. Like, I couldn't get the bus, which is free for under 18s. I had yeah. to get, like, the train. And it was, like, through zone one. So I had to, like, fund that. Because then, the, like, the cash that my mum would give me would literally only be enough for, like, lunch. And mm. also, like, 
I like doing stuff. Like if you know me, I like doing stuff. And if I do something, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it well. So like you know, going out, I wanted extra money to like go out, and like I wanted extra money to like do other stuff. Um, yeah, I, I I just like having money. I don't necessarily spend a lot of money to be honest. Like, but when I do spend a lot of money, it tends to be a significant amount. But then it's just it's just nice knowing that you have your own money. You know, I don't know. That's just how I see it. Yeah, no, just, I, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, it's just nice, like especially like you know, um, the the odd occasional times like after uh, school. I mean, like in six, well, I didn't have many friends in six, but like the odd occasional time will be like, oh, do you want to get McDonald's? And, you know, you can be like, yeah, because I've got some like cash on me or something like that, you know, or like weekend events. You'd be like, yeah, I've got cash on me. Mm-hmm. That's true. I was, some, I mean, I never really needed money to get to school because there was a bus ride for me. But mm. I was always getting what ten pound a week, like allegedly <laughs> from my parents for lunch. <laughs> and my friends were getting like twenty, thirty, forty, or like five pound every day. I'm like flipping hell. I can't keep up with wow. you guys. And then, wow. yeah, it's nuts. I, I must have just started selling sweets in year eight, year nine. So I'm like, you know what? <laughs> ten pound is like forty Kit Kats. <laughs> young hustling from young. Literally, man. Such, I mean, I could never work for someone. I learned by selling sweets in school. Like, I'd much rather do my own thing than, than mm. work for the man. Mm. I think for me, it's just like, I think that's another reason why I just, why I was kind of like, okay, let me just carry on with this medicine thing. Cause like, I just don't want to be having to like do higga hagga to get money. Like, cause I remember in college, I did every job under the sun. Like, it was this this um, girl that used to be in my uh, athletics club. It was her mom that like started me off with tutoring because she was like, "Oh, can you help tutor my daughter?" And then from there, she like sent my number out to different because obviously I like blitz my GCSE. So then she sent my number out to like different like mums and people. And then I started off tutoring. And I remember I got my first job the summer after GCSEs in like um, Westfield, like a shop in Westfield. I hated that retail, but then I, I did a bit of retail here and there, did a bit of tutoring, and I and I did a bit of like um babysitting, like literally anything, everything. But I was just kind of like, oh, I mean, it's calm for now, but I just know that in in the long run, like this is long, like this is a lot of effort. Like I know tutoring may not seem a lot of effort to people, but like this this just shows you put into perspective how lazy I am. Yeah, I just I don't want to <laughs> do something that will cause me any stress. I I literally want to sit down and get paid, like. Honestly, that's why, like, that's why when you're talking about the GPs chilling, I was like, yeah, whatever, that's bliss, man. That, that's what I want to be doing. So that's why I was kind of like, you know what, maybe this medicine thing, it's going to be peak for now, but pray to God, it will just allow me to sit down and get money. That's what I want. Like, I'm I'm not about getting my own business. Like, if I get my own business, that's great, but that's not my goal at the moment. You know, I'm not a hustler. I'm not, I just, I just want an easy, simple life, to be honest. Like, that's it. I want to live comfortably. <laughs> it's funny how you say that but you want to work in medicine like that seems like the most overworked underpaid industry in the world <laughs> it's true it's true but it's like, I mean I don't really make sense sometimes so there's that in it there's I'm surprised because like, obviously you mentioned you wanted to work in the industry before I feel like you were kind of following a law something cost thing where it's like obviously at the time it's like you invested a lot into it but do not think you'd benefit by starting earlier rather than later and like, if you don't enjoy medicine in you know three years time or whatever, it can be kind of peak. But the thing is, as well, like I, I hear that still. It's like it's not. Like I hate medicine. I, I'd like it. It's just I hate the the uni aspect of it. Like I hate the fact that like I'm constantly forced to have to like learn the stuff. Like there's sometimes where I'm like happy to sit and like learn, but other times I'm just like no, because there's a lot of medicine that I don't care about. Like I I, like, I did a bit of revision on the diabetic foot today. It'll, blood it was so boring like it was just like what you know and so it's not I hate it but it's just like there's a lot of it that I just don't care for and obviously having to do so much intense revision and so much like physical placement and hard work and all that kind of stuff it just doesn't it's not worth it and that's why I kind of say that I don't enjoy it but then going on to your whole thing about you know in two three years if I if I really don't like it I have another degree like I've already got a degree you know I can easily take that degree like I actually just filmed a video with my brother about kind of like you know uni transitioning to work stuff and like I can take that degree and do anything I want with that degree and even with medicine I can take that and do anything that I want with medicine there are so many medics like doctors who've literally did their foundation did like what five or how, however many years in medicine and like change to something else really quickly really easily 
you know so that's why I'm not too worried like yeah okay you've done you've done um what six years in uni just to like not be a doctor but I can't lie I don't care <laughs> like fair enough like you uni, <laughs> uni is long and all but at the end of it I'm going to come out with two degrees and one of them is going to be you know a bachelor in, in medical medicine and surgery it looks sick you know it looks sick mm. and if anything it'll help, it'll help me find someone that's rich to marry so I can just you know live my best life and it's not bad <laughs> mad yeah i get that and i feel like a degree in medicine is like i mean not not to show on any other degrees but medicine is such a big thing and it shows that you can actually grind out and put work in so you probably saw it for most industries afterwards yeah oh yeah hmm. I I hope so. is medicine I mean, I... is dentistry like, <laughs> different <laughs> If it, I mean, yeah, like a medic, a medic can't go straight into dentistry. Like you'd have to do the whole five years of dentistry again. Mad. Yeah. But then there are people who do that. They're called maxilla, maxillofacialist um, doctors. Um, and they earn, it's like, I think it's the highest paying medical dentistry speciality. It's mad. But who wants to do two, you know, times two of medicine and dentistry? It's a bit, it's a bit much. Yeah, it's like 10 years of your life. Exactly. Not, and then you have to include the foundation years of medicine and then the foundation years of dentistry and then, and then other just like your training for that. It's, I don't know. I mean, the, the money's <laughs> great, but I think it's for people who are really in it for the long haul, which I'm not about. Mm. Yeah, I get that. Crazy, man. Maybe I should have done 10 years of dentistry instead of 10 years of first year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, to this day, I don't know what you, what you, oh, I don't know what was going on. We thank God you're on, you're moving on to what third year, aren't it? Yeah, yeah. We will graduate at the same time. I'll <laughs> 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 do medical we'll engineering. Graduate the same time. <laughs> yeah, say no more, of course. Of course. <laughs> How did you find uni? Like now that you're. Well, you're not even graduating. Who am I kidding? But now that you're doing placements, <laughs> how did you find the whole education? Um, I miss uni purely because I mean, not uni, but like being in being in Bristol, like for the whole year. Purely just because, like, you could not take it. Like, I could still get away with the whole like cramming. Like, I don't recommend it, but like, you know, for the for like first and second year. I would literally do nothing the whole year and then like two and a half weeks before exams, I'll bang it out like my life depended on it. Um, and I'll still manage to like pass. And I'll actually pass decent, like above average results still, you know. Um, Humble brag, but go on. I'm downhill since then, I can't lie, but, <laughs> but I, missed, <laughs> I missed that part of, um, of uni where you could really just enjoy enjoy your life and like it was even like I, I was even like reminiscing today actually I was talking to you about that before we started the recording but like I was looking back at my like videos from first year and like don't get me wrong like there was there's a lot that happened in first year that that was really difficult like every year something happens to me I feel anyway that really difficult but it's like you look back on those memories and you're like okay it wasn't all rubbish you know it wasn't all dire there were some really really good parts you know and there were some really nice people that you know really helped you and I think that's the thing about uni. Uni is honestly about the people that you meet. Like, I can't stress that enough. And I think that's why it's so important to, like, you know, the whole, like, reinvent, you can reinvent yourself for uni. Like, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think reinvent yourself for whatever you want. But make sure you, you, whatever you're reinventing yourself, it has to be what you actually want and what's actually true to yourself, you know? So then that way you can attract people that you actually like, that you actually have stuff in common with. Because those are the people that, you know, will actually help you through the, dire parts of uni because when uni is tough oh it's 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 tough it's it's a mad one still but yeah yeah, i don't know i like yeah i don't know i preferred life without placement to be honest i I do Mm. that's interesting because i would have thought like well i guess because i've been there for so long but the thought of studying even more is is so long like i just want to (laughs) work And I guess it's different because work you're getting paid and placement you're not, but the whole concept of yeah. work life balance is kind of not there at uni when you're studying at least. Yeah. 
I mean, I think actually, I think placement gives you a good idea of work life balance. I can't lie because I'm exhausted. Like, I'm actually exhausted. And it's weird because I'm more tired now that I'm in Bath than when I was doing my placement in Bristol, like in Southmead. And I don't know why. I think, I don't know whether it's because I'm just, because I'm in Bath, I'm just actively doing more, like in the hospital, because obviously, if I, when I finish, I'm just going back to that, that room where I'm on my own. Um, but if it gives you a good idea because obviously you do like a good, especially in Bath, we start like 8 a.m. Sometimes you won't even finish till like 5, 6. And then you come back, you look for something to eat and then you basically got to do like some kind of work because you might have a tutorial the next day or you might, or you haven't done your CBL work or whatever it may be. You might have to do some work. And by the time you know it, it's like 9, 10 and you're thinking, oh, mate, I need to make my dinner. You make your dinner and then like it's, you eat it. It's already late. There's literally no, I haven't even watched my Netflix. I haven't even called my siblings. I call my siblings like pretty much like each of them, every, like not each of them, but like I rotate who I talk to in the evening, but I haven't even done that yet. And they're probably asleep. So it's too late for me to do that. So I think it does actually give me a good idea of what work-life balance is going to be like. And it's, it's uh, yeah, I think that's actually, yeah, that's actually a positive, I guess, from placement. It gives you a good idea. That's scary mm-hmm. though, because I feel like that work-life balance is it's not nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's not nice. It's not. Yikes. Is it only Monday to Friday? Well, for us at the moment, it is. But I think when we do obstetrics next year, it might, there'll be some weekends because obviously who knows when a woman will give birth. So, um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's such a weird thing. Like, I considered medicine when I was in, what, year 10, 11. But then the idea of, like, you mm. never know when someone's going to need you, it's like, I couldn't do that. I don't want to get a phone yeah, call at 2am, like, get in. Because I'm just going to say no. <laughs> I- I'm not a hero. Yeah. I mean, doctors aren't heroes, but it's it's a job. It's like even a firefighter, like, you know, you never know when they're going to be, you know, on shift and then, like, there's a fire happening at, at what, God knows what time. And the thing is, even if you get a call at 2, 3am, you're, pro- you're probably going to get the call because you are on a shift, you're doing that night shift, you know, so... That's it's not true. as bad as it's it's not as bad as it sounds, but it is still a bit peak. But somebody has to do the job, isn't it? Yeah, very true. All right, between our two takes, we're like an hour in now. I think it's about oh, time we start um, exposing people. Oh, eh? <laughs> <laughs> what's like the wildest story you have from from uni? Nothing, you know. I'm, I, I, you know, Jordan. I'm actually so boring. Like, I don't think people understand. Um, <laughs> I actually am. Like, even my brother says it all the time. And like, I, I think my siblings know that I'm boring. But uh, I don't. Honestly, I don't know. You should. You should. You should have told me this like yesterday. So I had. I had time to really think about it because. Um, no, nah, then, then you take out all the good parts. It's got to be under pressure. Honestly, I don't, I'm so, I don't even understand, I'm so boring. Like, even when I used to go, like, clubbing, I would be the first to leave. Like, I would literally, I would li- like, going clubbing to me was, like, literally ripping up a five or ten pound note because I'll go stay for, like, 20 minutes and leave. Um, <laughs> honestly, do you remember that time when me, you and Ori went and then we literally walked into lounge and then left after five seconds? That was a joke. That was um, funny. That was a whole, like, five pounds gone. I know it was you. We literally should could have just ripped our five pound. That would have been the same thing. What we did. Um, I'm trying to I, honestly, Jordan. I don't. I don't know. How was the night out for your birthday this year? It was okay. I didn't really enjoy it to be honest because um the music was a bit dead. I can't lie. I didn't. I personally didn't like the music, but everybody else said they liked it. So I was like, all right, calm, good for you. But um. And also because my friend Ruby, the light skin girl, because she was something happened, and so I was a bit stressed about her the whole night. So I couldn't really enjoy myself because of that, because it was like something deep was happening. She told me what happened afterwards, but you know, it was mm-hmm. like the way she reacted. I think obviously her 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 reaction was exaggerated by the fact that she was a bit drunk because it wasn't that deep when she told me. But at the time, I was a bit like, "What's going on?" And also, I was annoyed because you you and Brume left, so I was like dead. But um. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a party animal, man. I can't lie. I'm always the first to want to leave when we're in a club. So the best clubbing experience I've had yet is in London with Adiola. I can't lie. Bristol just Bristol won't have any wild 
night. So, sorry. You think? I've always heard both the nights are, are up there. For who, white or black? Uh, good question. <laughs> to me, a lot of my black friends just go SWX. I don't think we, we've been truly immersed into the scene. But I don't know. I've heard good things about Motion, uh, Prism. What's the other one? No, Motion's where I met Ruby. Really? Yeah. Motion. <laughs> Yeah, um, I went. I remember my favorite in second year. I won this, um, like I won like five free tickets to Lakota, and then they gave me like a bottle of Ray and Nephews and ginger beer. And I remember that night, that was quite, um, it was an okay night. I think the pre's was more fun. I think the thing is, I prefer the pre's than the actual night out. Mm. That's just it. But yeah, sorry, I can't, there's nothing wild. I'm sorry, I'm actually really boring. <laughs> Night nightmare. I hate what you mean though with pre's. Like, I'm the type of guy that would go to pre's and then just not go out, as you know. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I like it. that's what we did that in first year. Yeah, like all the time. Mm. Clubbing's just not fun. Well, it's, it's not social, which is kind of what people say it's supposed to be. But you can't talk there. You can't really yeah. do anything. Especially, other than drink. Especially in Bristol, because both people they're not even drunk drinking anymore. They're like on on something, so you definitely can't even talk to them. Mm. Drug culture is so weird. I'm happy I never got involved, but I can't understand how. Like, what is, it seems so expensive. <laughs> but the thing is, but the thing is, right? Yeah, it seems so expensive, but people forget Bristol is like the. I think it's the most um, what do you call it? Private school intake. So these, these people have money. Like even even during this lockdown, I was talking to one of my um my uh, friends about this actually we were saying how like wow all these medics are really ex- like she's also a medic well like how all these medics are really exposing themselves and their riches because they'll be taking video you know what i mean of like oh lockdown and then you just see their house and it's not when a house is a mansion or you'll see their like acres of <laughs> land that they call their small garden and you're just thinking like wow and here's me posting my youtube videos of my you know doing fitness in my garden which is they're probably thinking oh is that your front yard you know what i mean like i don't know it's just yeah Bristol. <laughs> Yeah, so true. I think I was talking to one of my engineering friends and I was like, how are you going to deal with um, working from home? And he's like, oh, I'll just go in my dad's work room. I'm like, your dad's what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Life, yeah um, rooms. I'm, I'm literally sitting in my car right now. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. sure. Well, you know, it is how it is, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's the way life is. Yeah. But it's time it, to... it is interesting. It is. I think for me, my main thing is like because a lot of them are so like I don't know if it's the right word, but flippant about like how they live and like they're so like you know if you know of course I'm rich, of course I'm this. But I think like like I don't I don't I don't actively seek to be rich, but I, I want to be comfortable, you know. And and you know if by God's grace I am rich in the future then I, I really want my life, not that I'm going to be like making my child work and grind like how I did, because no, if I have money, then why does my child have to grind like that? But I want, I would want them to have a really good understanding of like, fine, you don't have to grind for this money, but I did, me and your, me and your father did have to grind. You know what I mean? So like, because sometimes I just look at them in my like tutorials and like, they're so like, oh yes, of course I would have this money. I'm just like, well, you, like it's like they have no understanding of of what I mean maybe their parents got it from I don't know from their parents who knows but I don't know I just feel like I wouldn't want that for myself or my or my children mm-hmm. no I completely agree and I guess like not to generalize all the rich kids but you definitely do see a, a difference between the entitlement of some kids and you know the, the hard strong work uh, work ethic of others like mm. I was saying to, I think Doobie in like first or second year, like if I, if, if I was an adult now, my kid wouldn't have a phone. They wouldn't be out here with like the nicest shoes. I'll be like, you have to work for that. And obviously like same as what you're saying, I'm not going to work hard. Like I'm not going to like grind my kids out, but there, there has to be a way to instill that, that mm. understanding of, of like what, what money means and what it means to work hard without, mm. you know, yeah, I don't know. It's a scary thought. And I, I really hope that my kids in the future don't end up being super entitled if by God's grace I make it. Mm. Yeah, I hear that. 
it's funny though because my like... brothers now i mean we're by no means rich now don't get me wrong but my parents are obviously doing better off now than they were when they had me plus obviously i'm here to help mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. like i had to sell so many sweets in school to get a ps4 whereas my little brother now just has mine and I'm, i can see it now in real time like damn even though these kids technically had to grind they, like why they're just so entitled <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird yeah yeah i'm not gonna be a good but, dad man. but it happens man it's like <laughs> you're not gonna be, you i think you'll be a good dad i think <laughs> you say all this stuff like oh you're not gonna give your child this but no when when they're they're little and you see uh, you see like your your reflection technically you know depending on how strong your genes are you're gonna be like oh it's little jordan if he wants to pierce three just i don't know i don't know again but if he wants this i'm gonna give it to him all that stuff you're chatting about, I'm going to make them, it's nonsense. Your child's going to come up to you and be like, oh, daddy, can I have this, please? And you're, you're going to be like, yeah. <laughs> you're going to be like, you're going to whip out the wallet and you'll be like, here you go, get this for my son. So you're not, you're not going to do any of that. that. Whatever. Like, I don't know. I don't know. You can just, just give them whatever they want. <laughs> oh, man. That is interesting. I definitely want to learn more about, not necessarily raising kids, but I want to know more about, um, I guess, leadership and positive influence. Because that's something you don't learn in school. That is super important when you get older. I think that's something that you just generally learn in life, to be honest. Like, even even with your friends, because, like, again, what I was saying when I was, like, reminiscing about the people I met in first year and, like, not talking to them, I was kind of like, okay, so, like, let's be... Why haven't I? Um, also, I realized that people take me way too seriously because, like, I put it on my on my story on Instagram. There, people have been like messaging me. It's just like, honestly, guys, don't take me seriously at all. But um, like, you have to think, okay, have, was this person a positive influence in my life, or is this person positive in general? Do you know what I mean? And like, I guess you can kind of like assess like their behavior, not like in depth, but like, okay, what if you think someone's positive? Like, let's take. Um, Let's take Mary, I hope I can say it, Mary Oki, for example, yeah. Like, I, I absolutely love her. I think she's just great, like, through and through. She's a nice, as far as I know, anyway, I don't really know what goes on in the depth of her life, but as far as I know, she's a great person. She's incredibly nice, love to everyone, do you know what I mean? Like, doesn't hate a single soul. And you think, and I think, I look and I think that's a, that's a positive influence. Like, that's, like, positive, you know. And, I, and then I'll be like, okay, so what makes her so positive? It's the fact that she's so, um... What's the not social, but so like um like she'll go to anyone and be like, hi, what's your name? Where are you from? I'm having this thing at my house. Come, do you know what I mean? Like that's a that's a positive, that's that's like a that's a leadership in even in a way, do you know what I mean? For the fact that sorry, that for the fact that she didn't have to wait for that person to approach her. She was like, This I'm you know, she went introduce herself, you know, she was like, This is me. I'm extending a hand of friendship towards you. If you like, you can uh, you know you know, receive my hand and come along. Do you know what I mean? Like even even when it comes to like um schoolwork, like she got an award in um in her integration. She did biochemistry as well. Like imagine like she got an award for like I think one of the best grades or whatever her award was in. That's another positive aspect. That's another like leadership right there. Do you know what I mean? Like she's like, okay, I'm going into this not not completely unknown, I guess, because I guess um pre-med is um is a bit biochem, but she went into this whole new world. You know, what I mean, like, OK, this is uh, some areas of this is a bit new to me, you know, new people, new um, way of learning or whatever. I don't know if it was actually, but she was like, I'm going to conquer this. I'm going to like do this. I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And she did it. She conquered it. She got like a first and she um, uh, she got the, the award thing. You know what I mean? So I feel like mm. that's how I, I, I would say that's how you can look at leadership and that's how you can see things. Like you look at a person that that you really be like, like I'm not even that close with Mary, but I just I can't like praise her enough like I just think she's such a obviously I'll never say this to her face because you know I'm not that type of person that will praise you to your face because you know, <laughs> that's, that's a win that's a win I'll never do that but you know I, I just think she's outstanding to be honest personally but I think that's how I would do it like or, or you look for like uh, you know you look just I feel like you just look at friends or you look at people even if you're even if they're not your friend like there's so many people that I'm not particularly friends with um or like I'm not particularly close with but I see them like even there's some people in um like um let's say uh, medicine like uh what's that girl's name 
like oh like she's in my tutorial for example in Bath I won't say her name because I don't I'm not close to her like that but like I look at her and she she's a bit annoying I can't lie but like I love her like her work <laughs> ethic is, is you know she is but then it, her work ethic is so admirable you know what I mean it's so like wow it's so like that's amazing like you you could take stuff from that so anyway that yeah I, that was a really long-winded answer or like input to what you said but yeah mm. no I get you though a very good answer I guess it's a thing where like you have you ever heard of this the saying that if you're the smartest guy in the room you're in the wrong room yeah yeah i guess it's a thing like that where you look around and you see like i like this person for that and i don't like that person for something else and you just gradually tailor your experience to be more like mm. more positive and uplifting and stuff like that like mary is <laughs> great example like i don't i don't think i speak to mary at all like outside of uh random moments in person but She's someone that seems to be the maddest, like doing some crazy stuff. Mm. I saw she's what's that? She's like making clothes now or something. Like I swear she doesn't. She doesn't sleep. She doesn't she sleep. She does everything. <laughs> she you know that triangle. You know that triangle I told you about. The like one thing you you said about. I'm pretty sure she doesn't sleep. I'm pretty sure because she just she like she she dominates her academics. She does her clothing line. She's also like she's very active in literally every single society you can think of. Um, like she has like you know really good connections with her friendship her type of friends she's i think she's like dating at the moment oh i feel like i'm putting her on blast but basically she does she does everything she does everything she does it great and she does no no the thing is not like not not like she does it great but she does it to to a good and adequate standard you know what i mean like it's not like it's not like one area of her life is suffering or is or you know what i mean or needs attention every every i feel like every area of her life has sufficient attention and obviously, I may be completely wrong, but from what she projects out, that's how it looks, you know. And, you know, I feel like when looking at a positive aspect, when looking at how, you know, if you want to take good things from another person, that's something that, you know, I would look at and be like, yeah, this is a good thing to take. Mm. I think it's funny you, you reference the triangle again, because I think, at least in my, the, like, the way I see it, there are some people like Mary, of course, I put Shea in there, like Simi. Like, these people seem to just disregard that entirely and do everything, at least from, from the outside looking in. Like, I don't know who people Simi and Shea are in great shape. They're always out doing things. They read a lot. Like, how can you sacrifice anything and still do everything? I don't get it. There are some people that just lit, like, you're either, you're either someone like me, you know, who just does like average, and then you're like <laughs> top of gang, the, gang. like elite guys like that, like the Marys and the Simis and that, like, I don't know. I feel like I'm giving her way too much praise because I don't know what goes on behind closed doors. But yeah, I mean, we can uh, still we can still praise them. Everyone, everyone, um, you know, should be praised for something or another in their life. But at the same time, I feel like it's not something that we should feel um, like, I guess, like you know, confused or stressed towards. But it's more just like at the end of the day, again, we don't know what goes on behind closed doors, and we don't know what they've sacrificed, and we don't know how how they work. You know, like some people just generally need to be active like you know there's that it's like the restless leg syndrome some people can't stay still like i've been talking about in the beginning of this chat about people who in this lockdown are really struggling because they like being active they like doing stuff i remember i was actually messaging mary the other day oh well i was, I was actually asking her to like you know promote my youtube video but then i was like you know how are you doing <laughs> <laughs> and generally i was actually you know how are you doing because i know that she's so active so you know people like her who are really active it's, it's actually you know a genuine I want to find out how you're doing because I know you're so active. And so it, it might just be one of those things where some people just need to be doing stuff. Whereas other people like me, I can just be in my bed laying horizontally for, for until Christ's second coming, you know, like so I'm calm, whereas other people <laughs> can't. So, you know, yeah, it may that's just true. be, so, yeah, that it may not even be a sacrifice for them. What, like, you know. Mm. I guess it comes down to love and the process. Like you mentioned before, how like you hate the learning aspect of uni, well, like the lectures and stuff. And I'm very similar. Like I don't mind engineering, but having to learn all this other crap is like, I don't really find interest in that. I think mm. there are some people out there that just love what they do. And when you, when you're in that position, yeah. it's hard to, like you don't feel tired about doing something you love. Yeah, exactly. I was talking to, I remember like one night in Bath, I was like having this, oh, this long ass conversation with Shaya. Um, and it was just basically about like, 
I'm still yet to find something that I actually like, like something that I, I, I want to do, like I, I, I really like. Because um, Shaya, for example, I don't know if you actually, do you, are you close with Shaya or did you talk to him or anything like that? Not really, but I follow him around a lot. <laughs> the power oh. of Instagram. But um, <laughs> but he he's really into like performing arts and all that, and he's like he's very passionate about it. I remember mm. when he was telling me, um, he like sent me one of his um, what do you call it, um, texts or whatever. Anyway, but I was kind of like, wow, like must be nice to be so passionate about something, you know? Like you know when you see people who are so passionate about things, it's like wow, must be nice. Can't relate, but I want to. Mm. I really want to relate. So. Yeah, and I think yeah, when if you have a passion for it, it's like what they say, you know, that corny thing: you never work a day in your life if you love what you're doing. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be fair, like I feel that way, kind of looking at you guys in terms of your faith, because I, I could never, you know, be that that clued up with. Like I feel like I can ask people like you or Adam Doobie any question about anything regarding faith or spirituality, and there's always an answer. That sort of that to me is very similar to, you know, loving what you do and having a strong belief in something. Mm. Look, I, mean, I don't know where that if, comes from. If the, I mean, us giving you an answer because the the answers are in the Bible, so it's literally just us regurgitating what's in the Bible to you. Mm. No, but like the fact that you know it that well to be able to reciprocate it, like that's a the Bible's a fat book, well, a collection of books, shall I say. I can barely sit down and read a page of any book. <laughs> so for, to have someone know so much about something and be so passionate about it as well. Like I see, I see a lot of similarities between, between faith and a lot of people and, you know, loving what you do in terms of work or something. I guess. Yeah, no, definitely. I think cause I feel like I was, I was kind of discussing this with this, um, this, you know, one, one ragamuffin that I was chatting to the other day. And, um, Cause it was kind of like, he was like, oh, I'm not really too sure. Cause I was, I was like, oh, are you Christian? And like, and he was like, oh, I don't know. I was like, kind of dumb answer. He was like, yeah, yes or no. And it like, tell me. And he was like, oh, I'm not too sure. I'm still trying to find myself. And like, I feel like the essence of it is, especially for, for believers is that, you know, we were not created by a bang. We were created by the sovereign God. Okay. That's our creator. Like when you create something like this, like, okay, I, I bought a new bed when I was redoing my room. Right. And I was trying to like fit this piece. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know where this piece goes. I don't know what this piece is for. I don't know what its purpose is, you know, within this bed. So what did I do? I went to the creator's manual and the creator manual basically told me where that piece was meant to be. So in the same way, like, you know, as believers, we'll, we go to the creator in the, whether that's reading the scripture, whether that's through prayer, you know, meditation, um, whatever, to find out what it is that we're meant to be. You know, okay, yes, in that case, precious. Why do you still not know what 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 your love or what you're going to do with your life? It's it's it, it's a it's a marathon. It's a process. It's not just an instant, quick. You know, which which a lot of people think, you know, spirituality and religion is. It doesn't mean that your life gets automatically better. It just means that you have like you have a help. You have a helpmate, essentially. But yeah. I think that's I think that's that's what it is. I don't think it's anything to be like. Yes, yeah, so I think it is a passion. I guess I guess in a way because I mean you love it and you're dedicated to it. Uh, but it's a passion that that gives back in terms of you know um, Christianity that you know God will God will give back. He's there for you. He cares. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. I feel like I've had a lot of uh, chats about faith across the podcast, but. It's always refreshing to hear about uh, individual experiences and stuff, and like, why people are uh, like follow their faith compared to others. Because I, I don't know. I always feel like people, everyone always says the same thing, but it always comes from a different place. In terms of someone might have a, a quote unquote miraculous event happen to them that triggers it, or sometimes it's like your parents kind of breed you into it. But yeah, I don't know. It's fascinating to me. Hmm. Hmm. What would you say, like, because obviously you you talked about how you didn't really have many friends in sixth form, and then how like <laughs> how your placement's been kind of tight. How would you relate that with your, I guess, relationship with God? Because the way I hear it, when people talk about it, it's like God's always there. You, you people pray a lot or refer to the Bible a lot. 
Because that's something that's, have you been like strengthening your faith because of your experiences? Um, I think like people wise, I wouldn't say that's, that's always, that's been the thing that I go to God the most. And I think that's generally just because I've just been very unfortunate and unlucky with just friendships in general. Um, since like primary school, like I've just, I've just never really been good with long-term friendships and, you know, red flag. I honestly do not know why. Like I would love for somebody who I've been a friend with in the past to like pop up and be like, yo, precious, this is where you're going wrong. I would love that. It's always good to learn. But, um, I think for me, it's mainly just been difficulty. Like when things have gotten peak, especially academically, because, you know, so far I haven't had any health issues. Because obviously that one will probably be, you know, that's the one where everyone, whether they believe or not, will, will suddenly find God. But um, I haven't had any health issues so far. Um, I haven't had any significant family issues, thank God. Um, I, sh- I shan't have any in Jesus' name. Um, but I think it's mainly just academics, like especially, I remember in actually after Christmas, coming back from Christmas holiday in first year. And once, so one of my closest friends, like when I say this guy's like, this guy probably knows, like the worst not the worst but like whenever I'm like crying this is probably the guy that I will like I message um like so he probably knows like all like the proper difficulties that I go to I remember like it was um after Christmas and I was just like I was I just I was just so done with uni I just couldn't do it and then also like having to revise for um because we have January exams I was just I just I was just so done and I think it was like obviously uh, like talk, you know just talking it out like I always say talking it out actually does help even though you may not get an answer and I think that's it's always when it's always academic, basically, that it'll, I think I draw closer to God. Because I think even when I am a bit like, oh, I feel lonely, I have no friends or whatever. It's one of those things where I'm just like, oh, it's peak for like, I don't know, a night or two where I'm a bit like, oh, this is depressing. And then after that, I'm just like, well, you know what? I was born alone. I'll die alone. Like I just kind of had that mentality. But it's only when like when my academics start getting like really peak, really stressful that I think that's when. I start, you know, really, 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 really seeking God or like whenever, if I've been on a, on a different tangent to the narrow road that I should be following, that's when I'll kind of like, oh God, I'm sorry, I walked away, help me to, you know, maintain this, this, you know, path that you want me to be in. And essentially I want to walk in as well. But yeah, I think that's the main times that has really strengthened me. And especially especially during my um, interclation last year, that absolute demonic year that I had. It was, yeah, it was definitely, especially during um, when I had to, I did my dissertation, 15K words in 10 days. It was especially during then that I was like, yo, God, I really need some help and guidance and everything else in between. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. That's interesting but every, yeah but everyone has their triggers like sometimes it can be health that's when people that's when you know it, they, they're like i don't know that they want to seek god more or, like, i'm not saying that's the only time that they're seeking god but i think that's when you know people are literally brought to their knees you know everyone has those triggers that you know can bring them to their knees and they're really like oh my day whether the, whether they're on the right whether they they feel close with god or always they don't feel close with god like it, it doesn't matter yeah 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 Mm, I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's a mass thing. Like my friend Michael talks about this a lot as well. How um, a lot of people's interpretation of religion is just a poor understanding of statistics. And I think the reason why health, I think, is so significant is because whenever you're in hospital, you feel the odds are always against you. It's like all oh, my days, like if I don't make it out, it's because God's, you know, God willing or something. And I think it's a situation where. From the outside looking in, it's like there's always going to be a chance you're going to survive. There's always going to be a chance that you're going to die. But when it gets to, you know, when you get to the small, small odds and things just work out, people automatically, because it's hard to comprehend the maths there. Like, oh, it's a one in 10 chance I'm going to survive. So instead of trying to deep it like that, it's always like, oh, uh, just as Jesus is doing, this is God's, you know, God was on my side today. And I don't know, I, I see that a lot as well from what you're saying. And I definitely feel like most people that I know always relate it to typically a health thing, but I don't, I don't know. I don't like that because like people die all the time and how come God wasn't there for them? That, like I would always contradict that, that path with that question. Cause I, yeah, I don't know. I think it's weird. 
But I think I think the thing with that is like so this there's a, a pastor in America called Michael Todd. He's quite popular because he had the whole relationship goal series. Um I don't know if you know him or not, but he basically because I think there was a time here where he was talking about death and he was based actually I don't think it's even him, scrap that, but one pastor anyway, an American pastor it, you know, just because someone died, God was against them because, you, you know, you don't know what, like, you don't know what people have been praying for. You don't know what the situation is. You don't know what, whether they're, whether, you know, they have done what God has called them to do already. You know, that now he wants his child back or now, you know, that that person's job has been done or now, you know, you like, you know, people be praying, oh my God, God, I want the suffering to end. You know, I want my, my grandma, I want my friend to, you know, the suffering to end, this pain to end. Da, 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 da. So by him, you know, calling his child back, that in a way, it may not be the way that you like, but that's the way, that's another way of the suffering ending because we have to remember as well that God's thought is not our thought. We can, we cannot even begin to, to imagine or comprehend the, his thoughts at all, the way that he thinks. And that's why he's a sovereign God. Because if we could understand God, you know, the way God's thoughts and the decisions that he makes, he wouldn't be God, you know? So I think that's the one thing that we have to do. And, and you know, and it even, you know, it's, uh, actually, let me not say that because I'm not too sure, but, you know, it's, it's not everything that we're meant to understand that God does, you know, at the end of the day. And that's why it's so, it's just so important to just to lean on, you know, his understanding not our own, but his understanding. We may not, you know, he may not always enlighten us about his understanding, but that's it. You just lean on it. Mm. So I don't really think it's an odds thing. I don't, I don't really think it's a statistic thing. I think it's just a matter of just believing in God, that God knows best. You know, it's not that it's not necessarily just because people die, just because people get sick. It doesn't mean that, um, the devil's punishing them or God's allowing the devil to punish them or whatever. It's because God has a plan. Like, honestly, I think I remember even in second year. Yeah. Um, yeah. obviously I wasn't about that life in revision as you know and I was watching Gilmore Girls till 4am came late to my <laughs> exam sat the exam and believe it or not yeah I was still gassed I can't lie I, I, it was a mock it was a mock let me just uh, let me say that again yeah. I failed yeah but only but only by one mark in it anyway that still scared the living daylight out of me and I grinded yeah in two and a half weeks because I didn't learn my lesson but I did I actually did pretty sick like I can't lie I, I did pretty sick, but if it wasn't for that failing that I got, I would have just, and I, if I, cause if I still passed, I would have just carried on and I wouldn't have grinded the way that I did. You know, do you get it? So I thought mm-hmm. like, even though that was a really difficult time, cause even though I was, I was like, rah, God, this is peak, you know, like, how could you let this happen? You know, imagine me saying this when I've literally done no work, you know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says faith without works is dead. You know, I don't know what, how I could even say that, but I, I thank God that he did that because then it made me, you know, really, really grind grind hard and then I did really well not that it even counted but still it just showed me that you know put the work yeah. in and it was fine I know what you mean but um you can contradict that by saying like you failed on your own and you passed on your own it's like going back to this making it about statistical things there's always a chance you're going to fail I, I don't know I feel like there's a lot of a lot of holes <laughs> when it comes to I think in there, necessarily, I'm, God does. There, there might be, but then I think at the end of the day, it's one of those. It's the whole relationship with God is built on having faith with Him, and that's the scariest part. With I guess any religion having faith in that, in in you know, in whatever God that you want to. So that's why you know you can say all the statistics, all the chances, or whatever. That's fine, but then it, it just comes to the part of like if you want to, ha- if you're going to have faith or not, and that's that's why people find it scary. How can you have faith in something that you've never seen, something that you've never heard? And that's, I think, that's essentially the the difference, really. Because you can say it's statistics, or you can say it's faith, and essentially, you know, um, actually, let me not say religion because I don't know other religions, but Christianity is, is is about having faith and belief in God that He will do it, and that the plans that He has for you are for good and not for evil. Mm. Well put. Yeah, I get that. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, think about it. Think about it. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll get back to you in part two. Yay! I made it to part two. Oh my god! <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Come on. That's how we do things around here. When, I got to ask actually. When can I plug my YouTube? Huh? 
when can I plug my YouTube? Yeah, I was literally about to ask about YouTube. Go, go ahead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. Hi, guys. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Basically, I have a YouTube. <laughs> I have a YouTube um, called Precious Moment. Um, yeah. And basically I just do, it's mainly travel. Well, I wanted it to be a travel video, but obviously, I mean, a travel um, channel, but obviously I don't have enough peas to be traveling enough to give you sufficient content. But I've also started doing, especially during lockdown, just random videos, especially ones with my brother because he is here. Um, yeah, and they're really fun. And hopefully I'll do a lot more, especially when other people can come in the videos and, um, you can meet my, um, friends because, I feel like if you're, I feel like honestly, not, I'm not even in a biased way, but I feel like if you're friends with me and I genuinely like you and you're genuinely a good person, that's why even the friends that I've stopped and I'm not friends with anymore, I don't really, I don't have any like animosity towards them. I'm just more like, oh, that's a shame. Cause I still think they're great people because if I like somebody, then honestly that person's great. But yeah, that's my <laughs> plug done. Precious moment. Subscribe. Love it. I'll, I'll put it in the description. Yay. You have but, to put the yeah, link I'll... there because if they search my channel, they might not find it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll literally add just any precious moments account. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, how, how did you get into YouTube? It was just like to, to document what you do. So I made YouTube in 20, um, 2018, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've always wanted to make a YouTube actually from time because I'm a YouTube addict. Like, if you know me, I'll be watching vlogs, videos, pranks, everything. And I love YouTube so much. Um, but I was like, I was like, oh gosh, I don't know. I don't really like videoing myself because, like, I'm always like, oh, I don't know. It's just long. But I finally was like, okay, let me just do this. No, no, actually, what happened was I filmed my first, um, I filmed my holiday. Me and Ore, um, went to Barcelona and, uh, I have a friend from Spain and he was also there. And I decided to video it. And then I was like, actually, this was a really fun holiday. And like my friend, he made it so good. Like he like literally chauffeured us. I don't know if that's, if that's an actual word, but he literally drove us everywhere and like took us to really, really cool spots. It was great. Um, it's peak though, because when he came to London, I can't lie. I was just like, here's Shoreditch, bye. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, <laughs> I, I videoed it and I was kind of like, okay, let me edit it and let me upload it. And then I didn't, honestly, I didn't, I didn't really promote it. I think I put it on my Twitter and that's, that's about it. And that's because I don't really take my Twitter seriously anyway. And then I, I kept on just doing it whenever I traveled. And then I think I did like a couple random ones, like the balloon fiesta. And that's because Michael videoed it and he just has some good video shots. So I put it together. And then also I did like a Christmas dinner. But then um, I was kind of like, do you know what? It's lockdown. And especially Adiola, Adiola has been like my number one, like, um, like pusher and encourager for this whole um, YouTube thing. Um, which is really nice. Um, so I've just been, yeah, kind of doing it. Um, and I, yeah, I, I, I think I just do it mainly for the fun bit, to be honest, but I can't lie, this whole like paying for the editing software is really just like, just making me a bit more irritated now. I wish, I, I really wish I didn't sign. Guys, don't sign with a dove, man. Jarring. The hidden, the hidden clauses is rude. Nightmare. It's powerful though. You know? you know how to use it. It's called. Yeah, I don't. I'm not technically like smart so it's just a waste of time for me because that video and my, my even when my other brother not the one who was in it was like oh that's, that's like probably your best like edited video as well i have movies on my phone like calm it was it was annoying and long but it did the job <laughs> and that's free as well i played myself oh yikes that's a wholesome story though i i just thought like Thanks. you did it just for fun which i guess is true i i mean yeah, I I did it for fun. Like I can't honestly, I'm not gonna lie. I I'm not interesting enough to like do like to like get big or anything. I I personally don't think. And also, I don't know. I don't know if I have the like attention span either too. But I feel like, um, I feel like I'm the videos that I do are pretty like realistic. Like I I don't want to say wholesome, but they're just they're just me. So, if you want to know, I mean, I'm boring still, but if you want to know more about me, then, you know, I think they give a good insight. Ah, uh, it seems fun, though. But, uh, yeah, that's basically all I've got for you, man. Sick, 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 sick. 
Uh, great having you on. Oh my God, thank you for like letting me be on. This was fun. This was great. <laughs> Happy to have you, man. Yeah, I'm such a big fan of this channel. I was so excited. I was like, oh my God, when's Jordan going to ask me to be on? I just can't wait. <laughs> <laughs>